Air Force Pararescue, PJs as they're called, is one of our most specialized skill sets for airmen. It's a very selective process uh, just for pre-screening and then extraordinarily difficult uh, training evolution uh, to complete the pipeline. The, the, the lineage of the pararescue men goes back to being tied to the, uh, to, to the helicopter or to the airframe, if you will. They, they would have the skill sets to be able to go down the hoist and actually operate on the ground, even away from the hoist, pluck the, the pilot out of the jungle who had been shot down and put in the, the parachute training, the scuba training, uh, and the medical training into, into a person like that. I mean, you were looking for a strong, capable person. You were looking really for a pretty hardy fella. Once they start the training, they really lose about 80% of those who are given a, you know, an honest try. So uh, if you're one of those 10 to 20 folks out of that 100 that makes it, you got a lot going for you. We have the world's best combat search and rescue, absolute best uh, in, in the world because of uh, and in my opinion, uh, Scotty fails. I grew up in the western end of Maryland in the Appalachian Mountains, and quite frankly, there's just there's just not a ton of opportunity out there for a young fellow who's uh, at that time in his life's not going to go to go to go to college. So I enlisted in the Air Force, and I became a security policeman. And and one day I saw these guys running across the uh, the ramp at Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and they were happened to be pararescue men. And I said, hey, what do you guys do for a living? And they said, well, we dive and climb and, and jump out of airplanes and rescue people all over the world. And we get paid for it. And I said, well, that's for me. The president has directed United States forces to execute at 1 o'clock AM this morning pre-planned missions in Panama to protect American lives. It was mid to late December. And uh, we, had been, we had been rehearsing for for that raid, if you will, or that, that seizure of uh, Torres de Cumin Airfield, just outside of Panama City. His role was get the airfield up and running, be prepared to um, uh, treat and evacuate uh, the, the wounded, and then be on call for, for the next mission. Uh, first and foremost, it was a wet season. Uh, we were concerned about ground fog uh, coming in there at night with C-141 uh, uh, aircraft. So we were concerned about being able to get a navigation aid in on the ground to assist the airplanes. Because if we don't drop, if we don't have a successful airdrop at Trias de Cumin, then we're, we're operating from a secondary position. I was jumping with what they call a jump clearing team, which is a team of guys who, who are um, sort of first out over the airfield and our job is to make sure the airfield is open is to secure it and make sure there is no obstructions and, and then so you can bring in other forces. I remember inside the airplane, um, they came back from the cockpit and yelled that, hey, they know you're coming. Uh, we intercepted a phone call uh, to Panama and uh, they know you're coming. They know what time we're gonna be there. So everybody's thinking, great, you know, good news for us, <laughs> you know, and uh, so we kind of figured it, that, that it would be a little rougher than, than we had in, maybe anticipated. As you can imagine, a lot of things that the warriors were faced with in Panama, as in any conflict, most of which were un they, they couldn't possibly anticipate. I mean, surely, you know, if you're going to step out the door of an airplane, you're going to fall to the ground. That's a certainty. But you didn't know that while you were under canopy that they were going to try to pick you off while you were descending. That was not so much anticipated, and that's exactly what took place. Uh, consequently, a lot of war-related injuries were, uh, took place before the soldiers even hit the ground. Uh, a lot of the fear of the unknown is going on around there. Uh, although very well-prepared troops, uh, the Rangers or Special Tactics uh, Forces, everybody was very prepared, very capable, there's still always the unknown. Sometimes you have to go and talk to those leaders and make them see that oftentimes that the PR and CSAR are their last chance for a successful mission, you know. Um, take Somalia as a good example. Some things that strike me um, about Scott and his actions on the 3rd and 4th of October was, um, first of all, 
They, going into the, the fray when they did. Okay, going down the ropes, firefight ensuing, the helicopter they're roping from gets hit with an RPG while they're on the ropes, and all hell's breaking loose. And Scott gets wounded fairly early on. And, it, you know, when we heard someone got wounded, I knew it was Scott right away. It's just, Scott was going to be there. And if someone was going to get in the fray, it was going to be him. Normally, when, when we're going to assess a crash site, normally the, the, our, the, one of, the, of our tactics is, if you will, to turn hard over the top of the site so we can all look down on top of it, see exactly what we have. And then we come back, set up on an approach, and either land or fast rope to the to the uh, to the crash. In this particular case, um, uh, brownout was very bad. The enemy situation was very bad. Enemy fire was very high, to include lots of RPGs um, being fired at the helicopters uh, in the sky. So it was made clear that we were going to have one attempt, and so we basically flew straight to uh, the relative vicinity of the crash site. And uh, at one point, I distinctly recall uh, looking at Scott because we sat opposite each other in the cabin and I remember at one point uh, as we were you know moving and, and gyrating and getting ready to come in for the flare and posture and you know we just looked at each other and just eye contact and nodded and said okay here we go. And then we fast roped into the street. Um, during that fast rope it raised a tremendous amount of dust you couldn't see you couldn't see anything. As we collected at the crash, and as we continued to work that crash, they were able to, to zero in on our location. It was a steadily increasing rifle fire. So, so all of that was happening and got hit in the leg, got shot in the leg. And after he gets wounded, he continues to care for the wounded and return deadly accurate um, fire and at one point finally has to give himself an IV to keep from going into shock. Um, just amazing. I can tell you that, that we had not done um, an, an engagement at that particular time in 1993. We hadn't done that kind of an engagement um, and since, since Vietnam. And we had not done any urban seesaw, really. And I'm talking about a real close quarters sort of urban seesaw downed helicopter in really enemy territory and swarmed by, by, uh, by enemy personnel at that time. And so it was a, just a tremendous number of lessons learned. And it drove train, training programs for us for, for a long time. What I saw with Scotty is he continued to look at the battle in Mogadishu and how you could improve different aspects of the SAR mission. And he really focused to reassess and retool uh, what I call the SAR kits that were carried on the SAR birds. The original kits had uh, systems that are carried uh, within the ambulance crews and stuff to deal with car crashes like the Jaws of Life. And what they found on that uh, day in Mogadishu that those tools were not uh, conducive to basically getting through uh, helicopter crash uh, debris and uh, extracting uh, the airmen in those helicopters. That really impacted Scott, and Scotty quickly realized that we as the unit didn't have the training or the tools or the know-how to address a situation like that. So we went out and we found the tools and we got the training and we figured out and trained for it how not to let that happen again. Uh, had it not been for Scotty pushing uh, the command to have a SAR security bird to where they had rescue men that are there just dedicated to, to the what if. Uh, it was Scotty that pushed that initiative uh, hard. Nobody likes to talk about PR unless you know you're, you're, you happen to be a captive. So uh, that doesn't happen too often. And Scott, um, one of the things that he does is that he keeps that mission in the forefront of everybody's mind. So every, everybody that wants to push it off and not really deal with it, Scott brings that forward so people you know, plan for it and are prepped in case the worst happens. I think for most people, you know, what you really expect is open communication. Even if you don't like the communication you're going to receive, you have to respect the fact that you're going to get open and honest communication. There is no doubt that Scotty, Scotty would give that to you. The mission's not about CSAR or PR. 
personnel recovery, CSAR are there to support the mission. Sometimes it's difficult to find leaders in my mind who are educated um, enough to realize that things don't always go according to plan and that, and that even in times of constrained resources, it is still very, very smart to integrate uh, CSAR into the plan and have it trained, rehearsed, and ready just like the rest of the plan. We were overseas somewhere in the Middle East and uh, we had a, um, an 06 at the time in the leadership who asked Scott what he thought of the plan and how are things going. This was hours before things were getting ready to kick off for, for the mission night. And Scott basically said that it was all dicked up. <laughs> and this guy was like, I remember uh, he said, well, well what, what do you mean? He said, well, um, there's no way for us to respond for when things deviate from the plan and if there's a problem requiring any kind of search and rescue. And he said, well, what is the search and rescue plan now? The, 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 the 06 had asked Scott. And Scott said, dial 911. But unfortunately, over here, you don't get that kind of coverage. Uh, <laughs> I forgot all about that, but of course, that that sort of set things alight, if you will. And, uh, and it was readdressed immediately. Uh, it was pretty good. The J3 goes, I want to see you, 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 and you. <laughs> it, was just, it was very, very direct to the point. Um, but that style often worked pretty good because um, I remember on that exercise, uh, things got changed around and we did have some dedicated assets. And uh, um, that's the way Scott was, very blunt, to the point. Didn't have a lot of time to pretty things up. Well, I think that if you just look at Scott's resume, originally a security forces airman, transitioned into the pararescue career field, excelled there, migrated clearly as a volunteer, went through selection and assessment into the 2-4, you know, earned a silver star at the Battle of Mogadishu. In, in a Purple Heart as well. Uh, after retirement, sometime in the latter 90s, as I recall, he went and took a job at the Joint Siri Agency. And it was there that he, again, used this, this broader array of skills to continue to advance both the technology and the, the, the programmatic support associated with Americans that might end up in in a distressed situation. Well, Scott always believed that uh, training should be as realistic and as deep as you could possibly get without obviously injuring anybody. But uh, Scott's always been that kind of guy that uh, whether it's uh, survival training, parachute training, whatever it happened to be, it was gonna be full bore. Even when they're doing great, I'll throw something at them that messes things up and tries to, I try to tank the situation and I'll drag that on and on and on and on until I feel like I've achieved the effect that, that I want, which is them to innovate, them to think and never give up. What I remember from Scotty's training was trying to make it as miserable as possible. And that was, a, that was just as important as the muscle memory of repetition. His input was make it more miserable, make it more miserable. How miserable can you make it? You know, I think Winston Churchill said something to the effect that in every man's life it comes a time when you're tapped on the shoulder and asked to do something extraordinary. And it wouldn't it be a shame if you find yourself unprepared for what would be your moment of glory. And that's, that's kind of the way I like to, to go after things. I like the no-win scenario. I, I like to constantly train to the no-win scenario so that what, what I'm also doing is making my guys think. He, he was a pioneer in, in terms of Coming into a fledgling organization like Joint Personnel Recovery Agency, then Joint Services Siri Agency, and Scott brought his passion for supporting the troops into the personal recovery realm by instituting those very uh, approaches that he did in the military. Scott, he had gone to some planning meetings up in Washington, D.C., and he had come back and had told me very quickly that the project I was working on was going to deploy forward based upon some mission necessities. So Scotty uh, told me to write up the requirements of what I need to do the government acceptance test. 
Uh, what I really thought was interesting is when I went through my list of what I needed to do the test, the one thing I didn't have was an RJ, which is a very specific aircraft. So it was probably no more than maybe uh, seven days later, we're out in New Mexico. And as I was working with this technology, 30 something thousand feet above me was an RJ flying <laughs> overhead. And that was directly a result of Scotty. I don't know how he did it, but the one big, big hurdle that we needed to work with, Scotty did it. I still to this day don't know how he did it. That's what he does. It goes right to the mindset of a pararescueman. And the reason he has been so successful in that community is because he has bull dogged determination. Scott Fails has always been an achiever and you could see it in everything that he did. He knew exactly what he needed to do to win and he wasn't going to let anyone else interfere with that. What kind of person does it take? It, it, it's somebody who has that, that uh, uh, desire to just complete what you've started and they just, they just won't quit. You can't make them quit. And we are rescue men and we will go uh, anywhere, uh, any place. And uh, it doesn't have to be someone that's injured that you have to bring those medical skills to. It's just somebody who's found themselves in a, between a rock and hard spot and they need some help getting out of there. Lots of rescues in Iceland. When I was stationed there, which was about 85 through 87, the Icelanders at that time didn't have any rescue capability. They only had ground rescue capability, but they, they didn't have any helicopters. I mean, I can remember um, you know, I can remember one rescue mission where it was a dual engine airplane, like a little beach craft, twin beach airplane, and uh, there two guys in it, and they were making their way again, hopping over from, from Canada to Greenland to Iceland to Europe. And they were going to run out of gas about 100 miles off the coast of Iceland. And so we flew out there, and the whole time we're talking to these guys. And um, sure enough, we, we meet up with them, and, and, and we're flying near them and uh, the time is ticking off and sure enough, right on time, right on the queue. The guy comes up on the radio and he says, hey, there goes number one, number one's out. He's just calm as anything, yep, there goes number two. Okay, we're gonna start our approach to the water. And uh, he says, tell my wife and kids I love them. And so they hit the water, <clears throat> the wings snapped off, sunk to the bottom of the ocean. And I can remember thinking, wow, I mean, we're right there, right in on top of them in the water, and they were gone. So, tough mission, you know. He's not just a uh, uh, special tactics pararescueman. He's not just a uh, guy that, you know, lives on his professional side. He, he has a personal side. He has a family side, and he puts just as much commitment into that as he does his professional life. My rock is my wife. She's the light to my dark because, you know, because, you know, us guys, you know, we put our heads down and, man, you jock up and go do your missions and you're not thinking about home. You're not thinking about your wife. Honestly, you're thinking about that mission and that guy to left and right and the bad guys. And my wife, she's the one who allowed me, gave me, enabled me to go and do all these great, have all these great experiences and work with all these great people. Pararescue men are well known for being, you know, being the guys you want to go rescue you. But I'll tell you, Scott was as good as dealing death as he ever was at rescuing people. In fact, I think he preferred it. Leadership by example is an old phrase that's used a lot, but when you really see it, like you do with Scotty, that's when it has the maximum impact. If that guy wasn't dead, he wasn't going to be on no stretcher. He was up and going to be in the action making things happen. He from the practitioner level all the way to the policy level assured that Americans in harm's way will never be alone. You could go out into the career field today if they're still out there operating and you could, you could physically pick out based on their profile those that had been influenced by Scott Fails. Swimming in the ocean, uh, climbing a mountain, training uh, with rangers at night on an airfield, uh, flying in helicopters on uh, combat search and rescue missions, 
whatever it was, Scott was out there to do his job, which was that others may live. He is a doer. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's not going to just sit back and contemplate what needs to be done. He's going to start doing it. And if anything, with, with Scott, you've got to put the bridle to him to slow him down. Good luck. There are times, you know, times that just sort of, sort of sink into your memory and you never forget them. Um, a row of little birds all lined, all lined up, up in perfect, perfect, perfect alignment and synchronization, all running. One of those nights, absolutely pitch dark, but some lights way off in the distance. You just never forget you know, smells and the sounds and the temperature and and what we were there doing and, and through the fog, you think about the awesome power of the United States. Man, that's soft. That's what soft guys do.